we have a few minutes of questions, so uh, I can, I can, I can keep your hands up.
uh, mu a equals one in pi two six, it must happen. Also, you know, continuous measure spaces in classical probability we get taught to say almost surely will not happen, as mm -hmm. Raphael said. Mm -hmm. And of course, we restrict countability to additivity to countable sets in order that we don't get this kind of paradox of measure that a continuously large sum of measure zero events is of course the entire sample space, the probability class examples of the dart thrown at the zero one interval and so on. So I just could you say more about um, the additive the degree of additivity? I suppose it's regard restricted to the counter. Yeah. And uh, also, what about the kind of yeah, infinitesimal uh, probabilities that right. sometimes, are, which are recently vindicated, uh, to cope with the uh, small, you know, these kind of situations? So the mu a equals one. I don't think you can get anywhere with that because mu is not bounded above in the quantum measure. I mean, you can have events of arbitrarily high quantum measure. And one is not special in that case. It's just, you, there'll be no reason to single out one as having a special status. So mu a can be you know, 59 or 10 to the, I mean, it just, yeah. It, so it seems like zero is really the only special number. I mean, it's the only one you could point to as being, yeah, special at all. So, it, it, but, I, if one could reduce the problems of, of interpreting this measure to the same problems that there are in classical probability theory, I'm not saying that we've done so or that it's possible or it, it, making such a, but if one could, that would be great. I mean, that would be progress for me. So I think at the moment that's all that I feel that we are hoping for a, I mean, yeah, um, if it's as bad as, you know, if it's, <laughs> or no worse than, than trying to understand classical measure theory uh, and a you know, probability measure But you theory. are saying something different. I mean, yes. we're taught in probability class to yes. deny the preclusion rules, of course. We're <coughs> taught precisely to say that when we throw a pointed, a, a truly pointy dart at the zero one interval in all classical probability class, we are taught to say probability zero events happen. It lands at some particular real number. So I, I just want you to discuss the, what, what led you to endorse a conclusion, given that it contradicts conventional probability class wisdom in classical. Let me say something. Because yeah. um, you addressed the question to me as well. Yeah. First, I should mention, because no one actually in either talk pointed it out, is that the <coughs> Kolmogorov sum rule is not um, obeyed. So, and, and that was pointed out in both talks. <coughs> but there is a sum rule which is obeyed, which invol involves three disjoint events instead of just two disjoint events. It involves an alternating sum of the unions of the events and pairs, I mean, even and odd amounts. And that's sort of the universal result of the path integral. And it was actually tested. It can be viewed from one, from one point of view. It can be seen as actually the basic fact about the quantum measure in the sense in which it generalizes the classical probability measure. That was actually tested in an experiment um, recently in the Institute for Quantum Computing in Waterloo. Similar tests are going on elsewhere now with a higher degree of precision. So one, so if you if you said that the sum rule, you asked now you asked a technical, it's really a technical mathematical question, I think, in a sense more than a philosophical question, at least in part. So would the sum rule, for example, extend to countable sets, or what's the natural domain for the, the quantum measure? Um, is it the whole sigma algebra generated by the certain sets of simple events, or what is it exactly? 
uh, the answer the answer is not known. So in the case of where you do even try to do a continuum path integral, even non-relativistic path integral, it's already mathematically not a well-defined object. Yet. Um, this is so, in a sense, the mathematics is not far enough to pose your question. But there is a generalization of the um, multiplicative scheme to infinite sample spaces, infinite history spaces. And it looks like you might have some, I, I, this won't be clear, but it looks like you might have some <coughs> extra condition about this support should be a compact subset with respect to an appropriate topology. And that can even go a little way to ameliorating this kind of paradox that you referred to uh, in, that, in the case of throwing the dart. The last comment is, throwing the dart, I would see, is not in itself a I think that physics might bypass it because if there's a fundamental discreteness, then there's not a true continuum of histories in that sense. At least if we limit ourselves to a finite amount of time. But the prob but analogous problems come back when you consider time running to infinity. Um, and this, there's there's important and fascinating mathematical questions there on how to define the passing. In such, in such situations. And I, my feeling is if those are, satis if those are solved satisfactorily, it's clear you won't get the whole sigma algebra, that's clear. So what is the right replacement for the sigma algebra? Then we can revisit your question. I'm afraid on the subject of finite time, I have to bring this session to a close. And uh, I'm very sorry, Ken. <laughs> How, how quick is the question? It's, it's pretty quick. How quick is the other? Well, I, I, I at least <laughs> want, to, want to thank the speaker for an excellent um, talk. And I especially appreciated the motivation for the uh, Lagrangian. And I think at the end, if you have your final constraint on your path integral, I think your conclusion that it's going to look retrocausal is unavoidable. But my quick question is, when you say there are no realistic histories, you're uh, you're saying that there's no realistic particle histories. Now, if I have two particle histories that don't cross, to me, that, that's not weird. I mean, that, you could have a field story where they go through both paths in the interferometer. If they cross, it's weird. But if you have two particle histories, you say both of these are happening and they don't cross, um, why do you say that's non-deterministic? Why don't you have a field interpretation? Hey, oh, it's splitting and then coming back. Because they're not both happening. When it's... They could, but in a real life experience, uh, one space time, you could have something split up and come back. Right? But that, that's not the. That's not the vision of. It's not that there is something going this way and there's something going that way. That so, saying that reality corresponds to these two histories, is a coarse grained description of the world. It's saying that there's no fact of the matter about whether it goes this way, or whether it goes this way. But, but, but the. The description of the world is ontologically coarse-grained. I mean, it simply it, it corresponds to, to this one or this one, or, or, or the, but, but neither of them individually. That's the, so it's, yeah. Okay. And on that note, I think we should move to lunch. And once again, thank our speaker.